Systems go. <laughs> okay. Hello, Willkommen, Bienvenue, Konnichiwa, Ni Hao, Jambo, Marhaba. It's time for the Armist Inquisition yet again, episode 234 on Sunday, the 5th of June, 2022. I'm Armish Phil. I'm Armish Matt. We've no Ben this week. Where's Ben? Who knows? He disappeared again, didn't he? He disappeared to where? The Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs. A Yeah Yeah Yeah's concert. He has gone to a Yeah Yeah Yeah's oh, concert. No, no, no. <laughs> I think that's a cover story. I think he's actually secretly infiltrating the uh, the Bilderberg meetings in Washington. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, we'll get a boots on the ground report next we'll week. See. We'll see. But never fear, because we're joined with a very special guest this week. This week we've got Reverend Jamie Franklin from a Reverend podcast, Faith and Current Hello, Affairs. Yeah. How are you doing, Jamie? I'm really well, I'm really thank, well you. thank you, thank you, thank you, Phil, Phil and Matt, Matt for having me on. Really excited, really excited to, be to be here. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, I heard you on the Delling Pod uh, a few weeks ago, and yeah, yeah. Uh, I reached out to you, subscribed to the podcast. I, I've been listening to it since, and uh, it wasn't until after we'd uh, emailed that I found your YouTube channel, and oh, I yeah, thought, oh, yeah. hang on, I recognise this chap, and. I recognised you from an unheard interview back in the oh, yeah, depths oh, yeah. of the pandemic. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's oh, well, that's coincidence, isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was, that was, that was, that was, um, yes, yeah, so that was, 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 Glasgow, Glasgow. We, we, uh, uh, wrote, a wrote a letter uh, uh, opposing, opposing this policy, policy uh, from, uh, the from the position well, well, of, of, of church churchmen that we, we, we were against, we were against it and we would have implemented it in our churches, but during, during uh, well, well, raising, raising concerns, concerns about, about uh, uh, the pernicious, pernicious aspect of this, of this for, for society, society more widely, more widely as, well. as well. And we, and we, 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 did, we did an open letter and we got, in the end, I think we had about 2,000 church leaders and Christian leaders sign it. And uh, yeah, it, it ends up all over all over the media, BBC, BBC uh, you know, uh, all, all the major newspapers, newspapers and uh, did uh, the interview with with Freddie as, as well on on her. So it was a great success actually. And um, I, I think it's the kind of thing. It was a lot of work to get it all going, but I think it's the kind of thing which shows you can actually you can actually make a difference um, if you if 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 you have a good idea and you put your mind to it. You 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 really can make a difference and. Um, we had. I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but but we we know, for example, that we've had um, high profile politicians listening to our show um, as well. You know, I don't know if it's through that or for other reasons, but um, you know, we do like to think that we have had an impact. Um, while the while the rest of the church has been sort of pretty weak and going along with all the stuff, um, you know, all the COVID measures and everything like that, uh, there has been a small but vocal minority of churchmen who have opposed what's going on and seen it for what it is. And I think we have we have made a difference. I think that's one of the things that I found quite surprising during the, the pandemic was, was the reaction of the religious institutions and uh, the, well, the, the, the way they sort of fell in line with, with the government messaging and, and the government diktats and... Um, it, it, I found it disturbing, to be honest. Um, and I think it's sort of a measure of, of how far we've come from um, as a society, the way we regard religion uh, and the way it's sort of uh, put to one side. And, and as soon as, uh, you know, I think a lot of people see it as an old fashioned thing. It's something old people do. It's, it's not, uh, it's, it's lost its relevance, you know, in, in, in the UK and, um, uh, that that was something that I found disturbing is the best word for me to yeah. use, I think. Yeah, yeah, well, I found it disturbing as well. I think, you know, the thing that, the sort of central principle which 
I go back to with this stuff is that it reveals something about what you really believe when things like this happen. You know, it's kind of um, the sort of technical term in theology would be that it's an apocalyptic moment, you know, because an apocalypse doesn't technically, it's not technically to do with the end of the world necessarily. It's to do with an unveiling. That's what the, um, that's what the Greek words refers to an unveiling, you know, showing what's really there. And um, in the thing with the pandemic, you just think, you're just looking at it thinking, well, um, yeah, as, as churchmen, of course, we want to be concerned with people's welfare and their safety and we don't want churches to be unsafe places and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's not the sum total of what Christianity is. We believe that human beings have a transcendent end and believe it or not, the church has a part to play in helping them to connect with that aspect of their humanity. And for the government to shut the church down, to my mind, is a complete betrayal of that principle. For us to acquiesce to it is a, is a mm. betrayal of that principle. And so to have no dialogue about it at all, to have no discussion about whether this was the right thing for us to do or not, and just to give the government essentially a, a carte blanche to shut the church down whenever it feels like it on the basis of a pandemic, when let's face it, even from the beginning, it was fairly clear what the situation was in terms of who was vulnerable, who wasn't, uh, how deadly it was, and so on and so forth, uh, was was a was a terrible mistake it was a terrible mistake and part of the reason it was such an awful mistake is because this was our opportunity to actually speak to people about you know life and death uh, the meaning of life god heaven hell you know important stuff that a lot of the time people in our culture are not interested in you know because we're so materially saturated and we're so you know we have our felt needs met so so quickly and easily we had an opportunity the church had an opportunity and we absolutely blew it. <laughs> Fluffed you know, it. We really blew it. Yeah. We did. It, it, we shut the church doors. Shut the church doors. Literally shut all the doors of the parish churches in, in England. Is when it, people it, needed the doors open. Is so there... A, a, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Jamie. Is there a precedent yeah. for that happening before in history, for the churches shutting en masse like that? Well, the last time the churches shut in England en masse was... In, I think I believe it was twelve seventeen, right? So so it was it was a it James was a, the first. Twelve seventeen. No was, no sixteen or yeah, it wasn't James the first. No no, it's well it before that. But, but the um, the dispute was over the succession of I think it was Simon Langton to the Archbishop of Canterbury. So essentially eight hundred years ago, it was nothing to do with the plague, and um, and the and the the Pope I think closed the churches uh, for something like. I can't remember how long it was. It was like, it was it was a while. It was like six months or something like that. But that's so uh, eight hundred years ago. What what year was that, Jamie? Well, I think twelve sixteen or twelve seventeen. Right. So, so this is after the Crusade. This is after the Knights Templar were uh, pers yeah. persecuted. This is, kind of crusade, this is Crusade time, isn't this it? This is the we, era. Yeah. Yeah. This is after the second. Is it after the Second Crusade? I think. Um, Anyway, so the, the point is, um, it hasn't been closed for 800 years. There were, during outbreaks of plague in the later Middle Ages and uh, Reformation period, there were um, occasional closures on a limited basis in certain places of, of London, but there has never been a nationwide closure of churches on the basis of plague. At other times when there have been plagues, Churches and church leaders have taken the, the lead in terms of um, having um, processions, uh, calling for days of national repentance, uh, prayer and fasting, all of that kind of stuff. And, and whilst, whilst the churches were, were still open. Um, so the, if you, one of the most sho shocking things about this is if you look at the historical contrast with where we are today it's a completely different attitude and i would say it's a it's an attitude which actually um which actually shows you that the people in the past really believed that christianity was real and that it mattered whether the churches were open or not whereas today you could be forgiven for thinking that the church leaders don't think it's particularly important you know if if if, if the if the churches are if the churches are open if they if they're closed do people come to church or not you know, the Roman Catholics, I mean, I'm not Roman Catholic, right? So I'm, I'm Church of England vicar. And I'm, I'm only saying this because it's the most sort of um, extreme example. I'm not saying it to diss Roman Catholics. But Roman Catholics literally teach their people 
that you have to come to church every Sunday or else you're you're imperiling your soul, right? So you must go to church. It's an obligation every single Sunday, and you must take Mass, and you must be in a state of grace, otherwise you're in mortal danger. And they allowed their churches to be shut for, how, how long was it? I mean, in total, it was at least three months. Yeah. Um, so what, what are you saying? And then when the church is open again, what are you saying to people? Oh, well, you know, there were extenuating circumstances. You didn't need to go to church in those three months, but now you do again. It's kind of an inconsistent message. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I found it totally surreal. Um, the Right at the start of the lockdown, there was it was around Easter time. Mm-hmm. And I was at home watching um, the Easter Mass uh, being conducted in a church in Ireland where my missus's family is from. And it was just surreal watching this priest conduct the Mass on the most important day in the in the, in the in the church's calendar to an empty church. I just found it really surreal and hopefully never to be repeated. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, how ironic, you know, the, 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 the festival on which we celebrate Christ's defeat of death and, <laughs> and rising from the grave. I mean, <laughs> to, to ban people com- from coming to church. It's, you know, it's, it's shocking. It's shocking. It's, it's symbolically, we we spoke to um, we've had do you know do you know Laura Dosworth have you, have you I've read her? I've read the book yeah State of Fear yeah. yeah well we've had we've had her on our podcast a couple of times and and had some really interesting conversations about the kind of symbolic significance of the way church buildings were used during this period and again it's all it's all not not good so you know we we close we close the churches and and stop people from receiving the Eucharist. Uh, but we, but the churches were allowed to be open for um, for food banks. So, so material needs, um, that's fine. If people want to do that, that's fine. Uh, but we're not allowed to have the, the blessed sacrament. That's forbidden. Uh, we were allowed as as priests. We were allowed in this Church of England. We were allowed to clean our churches, but we were not allowed to have services in them during the the first period of the lockdown. We were banned from having services, so we could go and clean and maintain the building which was seen as important, but we couldn't have services even by ourselves. We couldn't pray in our own churches even by ourselves. And then, and then of course, and this is, this is the, the thing I've, I've seen Laura's written about and we spoke about, um, the, the churches were opened to be used as vaccination centres. Um, and and in, 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 on many occasions, you had organists playing background music whilst people were going in to be vaccinated. And so again, you know, you just you're just you're just looking at that. You're thinking, what is that saying symbolically to to the world? It's saying our services, our ceremonies, our rites, our practices, our sacraments are not important. They're not important. But what's important is and vaccines. It's kind of saying that um, the new sacrament of, of the new yeah, yeah, yeah scientism exactly. religion is the yeah. magic juice, yeah. isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's um, that's that's what Laura had a good phrase. She she called it something like, um, what was it? I can't remember. It, but but it was a kind it was a kind of like secular transubstantiation or something like that. If you're made you're made holy by you're not made holy by the sacrament anymore. You're made holy by the vaccine. So the vaccine takes on a kind of um, a sort of spiritual and and social dimension as well. Because and as as you guys, I'm sure I'm sure you know. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure. You know. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm probably preaching to the choir here. I imagine. But um, the the thing with the vaccine is, it's not just about having a vaccine. It's about it's about having the mark. It's about showing yourself to be to be ritually pure, and that that is that is part of what a sacrament does. It makes you ritually pure, um, not not in a not in a pernicious totalitarian sense, but um, but there's definitely an analogy there with the vaccine. And it's not, it's not insignificant that people were being vaccinated in churches whilst the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist was not, was not available to the people. I just find it astounding that you weren't allowed to go in yourself into your own church and pray by yourself. I find that unbelievable, really. I mean, did they ever give you a reason as to why you couldn't go in by yourself and do that? Yeah, so um, 
Yeah, numbers, number of reasons were given. So, so just to, for clarity, so this was only this was only in the Church of England. This right. didn't happen in the Roman Catholic Church. And Justin Welby, who did this along with at the time it was um, Archbishop Sentimer, who was the, the Archbishop of York at the time. He has subsequently said that he thinks he went too far and overreacted. So, you know, just to be just to be fair to him, he has said that. Um, but the reasons that were given at the time were um, they were along along the same kind of lines that would have been given by the um, by the technocrats uh, who were running the country at the time, which is that um, that um, if you travel from your house to the church building unnecessarily, right. then you are you know endangering people because you might you might bump into someone or you might <sighs> leave the building. But but the thing obviously the thing that you think about that is well you're saying it's all right to do that to clean the building and to maintain it to you know, <laughs> flush, flush the toilets and run, run the taps. It's all right to do mm. to, it's all right to do that, but it's not all right to do it to to go and pray. Mm. Um, and also there was all this thing about setting a good example that like we need to be leaders in the community so we need to set a good example so if everyone else is staying at home then we ought to stay at home as well and it's okay because we've got computers so we can broadcast over the internet um and so on and so forth but again you know people were saying you know my my friend um jonathan bezik who's um a priest in london who wrote a very good article for the spectator making this point is well you know people are um, people are going to work, you know, people are, people are delivering um, mail, people are um, working in supermarkets, uh, people are providing food for, for the population. They're not, they're not being called to set an example because they are, in that sense, because they are providing an essential service for people. Deemed and, essential. That's why I was yeah. going to, that was my next point was, yeah, that yeah. obviously it was not an essential service yeah. then was it yeah we're not essential we're non-essential that that's that's the basic message we are not essential and that's that is that's it isn't it that's that's the nub of the thing because if you're not essential the chaps if i'm not essential if, if my role is not essential i don't know what i'm doing here but i really i really don't if 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 the christian religion is just some kind of you know it's just some sort of um optional extra kind of free song a, a sort of decorative um a, a decorative uh, option that you can kind of add on to your life if you feel like it on sundays mm -hmm. you know that's just you know that doesn't that doesn't speak to me you know that doesn't mean anything to me that's not my conception of what i'm doing and it's not the conception of for a lot of other clergy as well who were similarly devastated by by this even people who were broadly in favour of what was going on with the COVID stuff, as I, I mean, I clearly wasn't, but there were lots of people who were, who were absolutely devastated by this. You know, you yeah. can't, you can't even go into a church building. Space. I mean, some, some people's churches are literally attached to their houses. You know, it's like they weren't even allowed to walk through a door into their church building to pray in their own house. Mm. I mean, it's just absurd. Yeah. It's symptomatic of the materialist paradigm that we find ourselves in. You know, the state was concerned with material sustenance, food, essential services like you described, heating, um, telecommunications all, and all that. But, um, you know, Jamie, your job is to save souls at the end of the day. And our current paradigm does not recognise that. And this is this this is the sticking point that we need to, to get past, that we need to allow people to take their own decisions and and i it's only over the last few years a couple of years and particularly over the last six months that i've i'm turning this way right. and um i just it upsets me it really ups upsets me that the state can wield so much power and as you described the church back down and it, yeah. it didn't it should have it should have put a stake in the ground and said no we're, we're making a stand now we're not having this you'll yeah. have to you'll have to arrest us yeah yeah absolutely i mean i i totally i totally agree and i'd have, I'd have loved to see that happen and it would have been i mean it would have been <laughs> it would have been interesting but, but that, that's what i <laughs> that's what i what i really what I really wanted, wanted to, to, to see i wanted somebody to 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 make a stand um to your point about the situation 
in society, I agree. And I think that what we see in society is what you might kind of call a kind of um, religion of humanitarianism, where the, the, basic, the basic kind of theological aspects of it would be um, a denial of the reality of sin and limitation for human beings. That's a really, really important thing. But then the other aspect of it, which you can see here, is the, the absolute prioritization of material needs, of human material needs. And that's what we see manifested in the COVID thing. Uh, the only thing that was uh, <coughs> to be of any significance at all was material need for human beings. So, in, and in this case, you know, our, our material need, you know, not to catch the virus and die, but but any other kind of need whatsoever. And I'm not even just talking about um, religious needs, you know, aesthetic and cultural practices as well. You know, going to the theatre or, or whatever it is, going yes. to music. Yes, all devalued. Okay. Yeah, all devalued. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that's what, and it shows you what what happens when you have this kind of absolute prioritization of of human need because the actual stuff that makes life worth living is subjugated beneath uh, a, a cold, rational, or, or I would call that sort of hyper rational utilitarian calculus. And yeah. it squeezes the life out of out of uh, huma- out of hu- human beings and out of society and civilization. I mean, wasn't it all, wasn't it awful what was going on? It just in terms of the crassness of it. Don't don't you think it was just tasteless? You know this. You know, like rainbows everywhere, and you know, I love the NHS. Clap the NHS on a Thursday night. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all of that stuff, and 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 I would say, I mean, I don't know. Are you guys are you, are you football fans? Yeah, I watch football. You gave up, didn't you, 10 years ago? Lapsed. I'm yeah, a lapsed right. football fan. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting, isn't it? I think that football has been... I, I'm, I'm a huge... I'm a Spurs fan, so I'm from Essex. And, um, you know, I grew up going to watch Spurs, uh, Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, and I'm still a football fan. I love football. But I think I think during the, the COVID stuff, the kind of... The, the, the political wokeness, which was on the edges of football was radicalised and it was allowed to enter into the game. And now we're seeing it absolutely proliferate in a way which is just nauseating. And I think, I think it happened during COVID. I think, I think uh, that the football, and probably sport more generally, I mean, I don't really follow much more sport than football, but, but it, was, it was hijacked by the kind of totalitarian politicisation of everything in this kind of woke motif. And, and now it's now now football is riddled with it. Football, yeah, it used to be the case not very long ago, right? Um, Pep Guardiola, Man City manager, about five years ago, I think it was. He he was wearing in a in a stadium. He was wearing a little um, yellow, I don't know what it was, a little yellow badge or something. But basically, this was this 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 symbol that he was wearing was showing support for independence for the Basque region of Spain, right? That's all it was. And he was fined by the FA for wearing that because political symbols were not allowed in football stadiums, in, in Premier League matches, or I think professional football in the UK, not allowed. And now look at us. We're having concerts for Ukraine before every match. We're having, you know, taking the knee for almost two years now. I mean, it's just becoming ridiculous. It's yeah. like, you know, we've got le- referees coming out left, right and centre and, and, and it being pasted all over the BBC Sport app and all this kind of stuff and you're just thinking is anyone actually going to talk about any football you know it's, it's become a vehicle for for political ideology mm. you're not allowed any displays of political symbolism except for the ones that we sanction and we deem that are acceptable and this is the danger yeah exactly. i suppose it's yeah that having that oversight from the fa or whoever's sort of pushing it because <laughs> uh, there'll be certain things that they, they won't allow i imagine and certain yeah. things that they do allow, I imagine. Yeah, well, you wouldn't be allowed a pro-Putin gesture, would you? <laughs> exactly, no, no. And a lot of this is being pushed through this mechanism of ESG, right, right. from the top, economic and uh, social yeah. governance. This is a term that we're going to be hearing more and more of in the coming years, and it's going to be tied to the way companies can refinance, the way they can take out loans. You know, you have to show that your company is, is sustainable socially and economically. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's a slippery road. I mean, um, 
just to sort of diverge, there was one subject I really wanted to get your take on, and it's yeah. something that uh, nags at me <laughs> perennial, perennially, and it's the issue of transhumanism. Right, yep. Um, for people who aren't familiar, I mean, it's it's sort of the the out augmentation of our physiology, whether that be you know uh, starting with a smart watch, but mm-hmm. that could go to sort of um, uh, smart uh, eye, eye lenses. We've looked at, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. there's people. Uh, there's people already, aren't they? With sort of like chips, chips under the the uh, back of their hands, so they can pay for things and and so on and so forth, isn't there? That's yeah. the kind of idea. And uh, if Ben was here, he would probably say it's just progress. It's progress. <laughs> it's it's inevitable. He and wants I ag- all of the chips, doesn't he? Yeah, I agree. It probably is inevitable, but that doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And um, mm-hmm. I'd like to get your take on it. I mean, one of the one of the interest questions that interests me is when do you stop being a human? Right. Yeah. You know, like. Um, I mean, I don't. Th- I think we would all agree that prosthetics, like a you know a veteran who's come back from the Middle East and lost an arm or a leg, if we can give them a prosthetic, mm-hmm. you know, that's that seems like a good thing. But where 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 do you think this line is? Where all of a sudden you're not a human anymore. You're something in between or different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess a lot of it depends on the kind of on what's actually technologically possible, doesn't it? Because I mean, you know, I mean, this this might sound a bit silly, silly, but it's one thing to say, you know, you could replace someone's arm, but I mean, is it is it actually possible to replace someone's brain or someone's head? Or I don't, I don't, do we actually know the answer? I mean, I'm sure you know lunatics like Yuval Noah Harari would say you could do anything, but it, are these are these things that are these things actually possible? I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I saw, um, uh, we, do, we do occasionally cover some sort of transhumanism stuff on our show. And um, one of the things we might talk about this week is this article that was in The Guardian about, you know, these sort of you know, these oh. headsets um, where, where they're talking about how you can, you can have a virtual baby. And yeah, how that will be, I've how got it here. Be, <laughs> it down. Yeah, like that kind of thing. Um, well, you know, what... What does this reveal? I was, I was listening. I was listening to someone talking about this, and I was thinking, you know, what does this actually reveal to us about about our humanity? Um, that that people seem to not find that to be an absolutely repulsive idea. Um, you know, we we are we're literally we're literally building the world that the Matrix imagines. Mm. You know, when whenever the Matrix when was the Matrix made? Like thirty years ago. Um, Obviously, that's there are precedents in intellectual thought before that as well. Um, you know, uh, Descartes, for example, speaks of an evil demon that may be deceiving us and 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 causing us to imagine a reality which isn't 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 what what is actually real, and so on and so forth. But but why why is it appealing to people? And I mean, this is kind of like a genuine question. Why is it appealing to people to live in a virtual world? When it's when it's not real, have we have we? I don't know what you guys think, but have we lost the uh, have we lost the have we lost the desire to actually live in reality? And we we prefer we'd prefer to be like what's that? Char- is the character's name? Is it um, Cipher? You know, who eats he eats the steak and he says, you know, the steak is not real, but it tastes it tastes delicious. And and the point of that story is that you're supposed to look at that and think that's perverse, right? Mm-hmm. You're say you know that's you know no that's wrong. You want to be like Neo or Trinity. You want to live in the real world, even if you suffer. But but we but for some reason people don't. I don't know. They don't get that. Or is is Mark is Mark Zuckerberg just a lunatic who doesn't? Is is he just is he just disconnected from from the market in this sense? Will will human beings just say you know we're not having this and we've got no interest in it and you're just freaks who are you know interested in you're too interested in computers? I don't know. What do you guys think? There's definitely tinges of Brave New World when it comes to the metaverse. And um, this is where I think Huxley got it right more so than Orwell in, in this sort of idea of entertaining ourselves to death, as it were, and just existing for um, sort of what's this sort of instant gratification. Um, well, I think, you know, I, it was something that I always come back to when we've been talking about the... Um sort of like the lockdowns originally was this kind of idea of 
it's a juxtaposition really because I'm kind of thinking in the lockdowns it, there was a, a philosopher is it Michael Crawford Michael B Crawford Michael B Crawford yeah said that you know one one of thing, he, things sorry that he was thinking about was um, that you know limiting people's choice was quite appealing for some people so you know the government telling you what you can and can't do was yeah. really something that people um, enjoyed in the lockdown um, yeah. but this is kind of opposed to I suppose being in this virtual world where you can have anything potentially yeah. and maybe it kind of feeds into this kind of materialistic view where um you know you can get anything that you want essentially in yeah. this unreal world perhaps yeah. it's that yeah, i don't I, know I, I think what you're saying is absolutely i think you're i think you're absolutely right it's about you know, it's interesting here because I think it's about responsibility, isn't it? It's about taking responsibility. So, so it's actually very comforting for the state for some people. I mean, mm. it's not not for me because I'm a natural contrarian, but but <laughs> it's very comforting for the state to say, oh, you know what? We're going to make all your decisions for you, and all you have to do is just do exactly what we say, and everything will be fine. You won't die. You won't kill Granny. You know, blah blah blah. Everything everything will be fine. So that's actually quite comforting. You know, it's like it 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 regresses you to the status of a child, with with your parent just telling you, you know, don't go over there, don't do this, don't touch that, blah blah blah. Um, in the metaverse, right there there are no consequences, right? Because presumably, if there are bad consequences to something that happens, you could just reset the program or you can cancel your subscription. To so so, I mean, <laughs> how perverse is that, right? So presumably, these kids you'd have, these virtual kids you'd have, would be on subscription or something like that, <laughs> and they're, they're, they're charge. Right. So if you, you get if you get fed up with being a parent, you can just cancel your subscription, you know, and it's like it's like this is so shallow. You know, it's so shallow. Do people I mean, Phil, you've got you've got kids, don't you? Yeah. Right. I don't know, Matt, do you I mean, do you have kids, Matt? Yeah, I've got we both got two boys, actually. Yeah. 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 So so I mean. Don't you think that? Don't you think it's shallow that you'd want to have the option? You know, like when you have your kids, you know, oh well, you know, we'll have the kids, and you know, we'll 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 kind of, you know, we'll give it a try. But if it if it if it doesn't work out, we'll just have we'll just have some kind of um, just some contract with somebody where we whereby we can just get rid of them if if it doesn't work out. We'll just send them off somewhere. It's like with no con, or even you know, in this case, it's like well, if you have the virtual baby and your subscription runs out, what does that mean? They just disappear. So your kids, your kids just disappear. I mean, it's like. Um, that is that is what what's great about having kids is the sense of a relationship which which develops over time you know it's it's a beautiful thing it's a it's a relationship of of trust and and mutual um love and exchange and sacrifice on the on the part of the parent um uh, you know for the for the first you know substantial period of time and the taking of responsibility as a parent changes you absolutely you know, you change, especially course, men young yeah. men yeah 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 it does it does and in 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 um in my way of viewing things i would say i think god has made it this way i mean being a parent takes ages you know we're about to have our we're about to have our fourth kid um and and it, it's a long it's a long haul everything is everything is long everything takes ages pregnancy takes ages you know the baby <laughs> stage takes ages the toddler stage takes ages after that you know, you've got all other challenges and then they're only, you know, then it's only, you're only 10 years in and you've, you know, there's a load of other kids as well. And your 10 year old still has another eight years and then they're adults and they probably cause you all sorts of problems then. And it never ends. Mm. Right. But this mm. is the point. It's, it's, it's set up this way so that, so that God, I believe can wean us off our egotism and our selfishness and our desire to just please ourselves and only think about ourselves and never think about anyone else. Is that when you when you have kids, you can't be like that. You know, I slept for four hours last night. I'm not complaining. I'm just ranting a bit. You know? <laughs> I slept for four hours last night because I woke up in the middle of the night because I'm now used to waking up all the time and I can't sleep through. And then after about an hour and a half, just as I was going back to sleep, my one and a half year old woke up. My <laughs> wife's almost nine nine months pregnant, so I had to go in, and I don't want her to come into bed with me. So I'm sitting by the cot waiting for her to go to sleep for two hours. By that point, it's five o'clock and the sun is up. You know, yes. so I was awake half the night, and you know, it. You've got to you've got to find a way of dealing with it. You've got to find a way of coping with it, where you don't just become bitter and angry, and 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 and, and twisted. So mm. so you know, so it changes. It changes. You've got to develop patience. 
you know and you've got to you've got to realize that you've got to sacrifice for something else and this is one of the reasons you know that's why uh, reasons i've got hope that things like you know these absurd ideas with the metaverse and so on you know that these will fail is because you look at people who are saying this in the culture right there aren't many of them but there are some like people like Jordan Peterson, they're saying, look, you need to take responsibility, especially young men. You know, you've got to take responsibility. Your life is a mess. You know, your house is a mess. Your your finances are a mess. You've got to sort yourself out. And people respond really, really well. You know, this guy is enormous. Yeah. You know, he's, he's a star. He's like a rock star just for telling people to clean their rooms. <laughs> you know? So it's, it's good, I think. Mm. I think there's a lot of um, pandering, isn't there, to people's needs rather than sort of telling people, and I suppose kind of saying it's not your fault quite a lot uh, of yeah. the time. V- victimhood. Um, yeah. When, you know, I suppose, you know, if someone is, is a, you know, a genuine victim of a crime or whatever, you know, that's one thing, isn't it? But are you a victim of sort of um, being tempted to buy, like you said, if you're talking about finances, you know, get a, a car on lease hire, get a house that's too expensive for you you know yeah. spend loads of money on credit cards because it's there but at the end of the day that was a choice wasn't it you might have made it for sort of various reasons but there is a person that can sort that out essentially at the end of the day isn't there mm-hmm. yeah yeah you you've got to sort it out yeah, yeah exactly and and this is the thing it's actually it's actually really interesting because i think this thing about um you know being a victim it's actually a sort of perverse um it's a perverse kind of twisting of, of a christian idea you know, because in, in, in the ancient world, you know, nobody thought victims were, were good. You know, in the Roman world, you'd get, you know, you'd get crucified and that would be a terrible thing because you'd be, you know, you'd be you'd be crucified in this shameful way with the dregs of society and it would be a disgusting and shameful end and no one would think, oh, that's a shame, that person was crucified, he probably shouldn't have been. They would look at them and they would think they're scum, they're being crucified and that's good. Um, the, the in In the Christian religion, you have... You have God essentially being taking the place of a slave and being crucified. And the whole idea of becoming a victim, becoming a righteous victim, <laughs> emerges for the first time in, in intellectual and cultural history. And really, I think what we see now is we see a kind of, you know, sort of perverse, crass twisting of the idea of being a victim, whereby just being a victim in itself, for whatever reason, is deemed to give you some kind of superiority. And of course, it's kind of mixed up with identity politics and everything like that. Um, But the the problem with this is, exactly as we've been um, describing, is that it it makes people, um, well, what would you say? Well, it means people don't take responsibility, and it it means that they blame everything except for themselves, for for their problems. And everything is... Everything is somebody else's fault. Everything is because, you know, I'm being discriminated against. Everything is because the world is out to get me and things aren't fair and there isn't social justice and blah, blah, blah. And it basically means that we've got, um, you know, a, a whole a whole culture, a kind of youth culture emerging, uh, which hasn't progressed out of adolescence, essentially. Yeah, and it doesn't do, it doesn't help. There is no benefit in it. You know, hmm. as, as harsh as it may be, you could have had the worst upbringing imaginable, but um, sort of wearing this badge of being a victim and complaining about it on social media is doing nothing for you. You know, it's like there's a certain point where you have to say, this is my lot, I've got a choice. I either get on with it or I keep bleating. And, and you know, it's, it's just, it's just there's no benefit in it. But yeah. it's, it's, a hard, it's hard to say. Yeah. Well, what they want is they want people to give them stuff, isn't it? Well, you know, I need more stuff. You know, I need more. I need more privilege because I don't have enough privilege. Mm. And and essentially, all 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 society is is um, competing sets of privilege. And I I don't have enough, so give me more. Rather than as you say, you know, take responsibility, do some good stuff, and you know, and work hard and 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 see where it gets you. But we, 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 there are people like that. There are figures like that. I mean, I'm not a particular massive fan of him, but I was, um, <laughs> I was talking to my wife the other day about Joe Wicks, um, you know, who is a, he's kind of insufferable, but, but he, he's, he's come from a, you know, he's come from a really bad background and he's, he's, you know, he's a multimillionaire, you know, mm. he's got his own, he's got his own um, range of cookbooks, you know, he's doing all right, you know, he's, he's doing okay. He's taking responsibility. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and I think he kind of talks about, you know, deliberately making that choice, essentially, when he was younger. Because uh, there has been something recently on the BBC, I've not watched it, but he talks about so his dad had a, a heroin addiction, I think, whilst he was growing up, yeah. and his mum had, like, um, severe OCD, and it had an impact on, obviously, his household and all the rest of it. But he made a decision at that point to say, my family is not going to be like this, basically. Yeah. And he took yeah. a, a different path. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's quite interesting, isn't it? So I suppose that you, you can make, well, it's not interesting. I think it's just a fact that if you make those different choices, it has a yeah. different impact on your life, doesn't it? Yeah. Of course, of course it does. And this, this is especially true. Um, this is so important for, for young men as well, you know, because there are, there are, there are plenty of, um, you know, mature, attractive, marriable young women who are, who are out there who are just looking for, for responsible men who will, you know, who will marry them, have kids with them, be a good father, provide an income for them. And, you know, unfortunately, those kind of people are few and far between nowadays. And we've, we've got a generation of, of boys who um, don't want to take responsibility for anything. So, you know, it's the, it, it is possible to take responsibility, to work hard, to do well. And life is not just about what other people give you or what what you're born into you know we've all had disadvantages you know this is the thing it's like you know i um i've had disadvantages in my life i've had advantages as well but you wouldn't know that to look at me according to the kind of identity politics people they just look at me and they say well he's a white heterosexual male uh you know he's middle class you know i, I went to public school so basically i've got all the boxes you know privilege ticked you know but i i came from a broken home my parents were divorced you know, and that's a massive disadvantage. It's a massive disadvantage in life to, to only be raised by one parent. I mean, if you look at the, s- the social statistics, mm-hmm. um, into, you, you do a comparison between kids who, who come from broken homes and kids who have two parents. There's no comparison in terms of, you know, predicted salary, in terms of your likelihood to be, um, to be arrested, to be charged with serious crimes, to do time in prison, you know, all of that stuff. There's no, there's no comparison. In terms of, in terms of um, predictability, being having two parents is pretty much the the greatest advantage that you can have i mean there may be other ones as well in terms of wealth and things like that but having two parents as opposed to having one parent or no parents yeah you know that's that's absolutely massive but that doesn't come into it it's just about mm. you know whether you're white and whether you're black whether you're whether you're gay or straight whether you're you're a man or a woman basically that's it and yeah it's far too simplistic I mean, speaking in general terms, I mean, uh, not to disparage, I know there are loads of single mums who do an incredible job and yeah, it's, it's not, we're not um, denigrating that. And there are sometimes, I can imagine there are some people, uh, some dads who would be better out of the house. Yeah. You yes. know, so we're talking in general terms. We all, we're all parents. We know it. It's bloody, yeah. blooming hard work. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a hard, it's hard work raising kids and, Crikey, I've been home alone with my kids all week because my missus has been on her jollies. And it's yeah. exhausting when, you're, when you've are when you only got one pair of hands and you have to do all the fetching and carrying, the cooking, the cleaning, all the appointments that children have. They have very active social calendars, birthday parties, <laughs> etc. You know, yeah. it's, a, yeah. it's a logistical nightmare at times. But yeah. 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 So, yeah. Hey, yeah. Phil, can I ask you a question? Mm. I mean, I, I, I was really interested in what you said earlier about you sort of having a change in the last six months um, in terms of your sort of outlook and sort of being drawn perhaps to more sort of spiritual things. Could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I noticed um, over the last couple, uh, maybe three months, I've been to church twice for two sacraments, yeah. one christening, one uh, first Holy Communion. And both times I had this sort of little voice in my head saying, I think you sh- maybe you should come here more often. Right. And it wasn't the vicar. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't the vicar. It was my oh, own... You're whispering into your ear. It was my inter- either my own internal monologue or my subconscious. Right. I don't know. And uh, I've always been interested... Well, not always. I, uh, I was raised Catholic and went to a Catholic school, but I uh, probably abandoned my faith young 10 to say 10 years old yeah and then as i got into sort of maybe my late teens early 20s i started um looking into subjects like esotericism and uh, astral theology and stuff like that and 
these subjects, and we've spoken to a lot of people who, you know, write books and whatnot in this field, and um, they'll tell you it's all, the Bible's all uh, myth, it's allegory. There's no his- historicity there. Or the same with, um, say, the, the story of Jesus, people will, um, there's a famous guy, uh, Jordan Maxwell, who's one of the more famous, um, did you ever see the movie Zeitgeist? No, I've not seen that. Right, so Zeitgeist came out shortly after September the 11th, and it's a conspiracy movie that landed on YouTube, uh, written and directed by Peter Joseph. He was on the Joe Rogan experience back in the day. It was a huge internet sensation around 2002, 2003. And it's supposed to be about conspiracies on September the 11th, but the first half of the film is basically deconstructing Christianity. Right. And a lot of that work was based on this guy, Jordan Maxwell, who I've si- since seen his work debunked. Uh, he mm-hmm. passed away uh, a few months ago. But it's the same story. It's, 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 it's mithraism. Um, the story, you know, they'll draw uh, parallels to the story of Osiris, uh, Horus, and Jesus. Yeah. And, and because there are similarities, oh, well, we've had it with Ryan. You know, Jesus is a mushroom. <laughs> You know, so like I read John Marco Allegro's work, Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, and such. Any? Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. I mean, it's an old book. He was a scholar who worked on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and he makes compelling arguments. But as I am not a linguist or an expert in ancient languages, I can't evaluate it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so over the last couple of years, and particularly over the last few months, I've just had—I don't know—I can't—I don't know how to describe it, but I've just sort of felt a pull towards. Um, Christianity, as I've read more, read more about ancient history and theology, and I, I can't describe it, where it's coming from or, or why it's happening now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So is it is it to do with stuff that's going on in culture and society, or is it more of a sort of internal thing, or is it a mixture of both, or what do you think? It could be both. It could be that the events of the last two and a half years have focused my mind on what's important mm, yeah yeah um i oh, it it was inhumane how we treated people yeah um i'm lucky i didn't lose anyone over the pandemic but if someone i loved was in a hospital taking their last through few breaths and someone was trying to stand outside and stop me from entering um, that would have torn me to pieces, you know. I, I can't believe that we acted in that way yeah. to people, yeah. and uh, it makes you it made, makes you realize what's important in life. Mm. And um, this materialism, like I, I completely reject it. I don't care about money or things or holidays. I like information. I like learning about stuff and trying to learn about myself and, and sort of my kids and making sure my kids are all right and they're developing. And that's yeah. what's important. Yeah. And it was all that stuff that was stripped away, yeah. you know, for the for the purposes of, you know, flattening the curve. Three yeah. weeks, three weeks to flatten the curve, you know. And I yeah. guess maybe that's part of the reason. Maybe that just focused me spiritually in that way. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, the reason I ask the question is because um, since we've been doing our podcast, which we started um, in November um, 2020, so maybe it was September or October, I can't quite remember. But anyway, since we started doing it, um, we've had lots and lots of people get in touch saying that they're not religious or that they used to be Christian or you know, they used to be atheists, but they are rethinking things as a result of what's been going on. Um, and it's kind of interesting because, <laughs> you know, we were talking about the catastrophic failure, really, of the church <laughs> um, to to do anything decent um, on a on a on a, at least on a national level. There were you know exceptions, obviously, um, but nevertheless, there are still lots of people who are for the first time interested in spiritual things in Christianity in particular, you know, that I, that I know, um, lots of people, there's a huge contingent of people in fact, and you can see it, you know, with, 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 um, you know, podcasts that are well followed, you know, like, um, like Denning Polis, for example, there's a huge amount of talk about Christianity and stuff on there. Um, now I think that the thing I hear 
really regularly is that um, people saying things like, I felt tangible sense of evil and darkness, you know, and, and it was, it was frightening and it was, or it was depressing or it was, it was, it was uncomfortable for me. And I, and I, I thought, you know, I need to go to church or something like that. It was, it, it's, it's, it's just a, a, a thought process that I've heard described to me over and over again. I mean, probably hundreds of times by this point, um, if, if not more, uh, you know, in emails and people telling me this, this face to face. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. Evil is real. Um, sin is real. There is a real devil. There are real demons. Um, at, at times, I believe that the demonic um, influence over society is is greater, or at least more manifest. And I think that 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 is what happens, and is potentially still happening. I'm sure. I'm sure there's a huge amount of demonic influence in terms of these organisations like the WEF and the WHO. That's what was going on at the time. So people sense that, and they they know there's a, they know there's a darkness, and they want to see a spiritual light. It's um, I don't know. The thing I was thinking about is that film um, from Dust Till Dawn. Have you seen that film? Yeah. Um, you know where where George Clooney and Quentin Tarantino these they're bank robbers or something, aren't they? And they um, they turn up at this this bar. Um, you know they've done some you know they've done some heist or something. They turn up in this bar, and then at, at midnight it turns out everyone in this bar is a vampire. <laughs> it's an absolutely crazy film, mm. but. Um, they're, they're, they've got this. Um, they've got this churchman who's lost their faith with them. Who's played by Harvey Keitel, who they've taken as a, a hostage, if I recall rightly. Anyway, so at one point, George Clooney, who's this you know nasty criminal guy, um, says to says to him, you know these you know these mother effers are straight out of the pits of hell, and if there's a hell, there's going to be a heaven. And I think that that is that's what people are sensing. I agree. Uh, yeah, it's sort of one of the th sort of areas I wanted to ask you was about maybe this sort of spiritual war that seems to be happening and what your take on it was. I mean, I was just going to ask that this might mm. just fit in now as well, which was uh, it's probably a little bit linked to what we were talking about in terms of the transhumanism. But this idea of um, if we get rid of death, what does that mean for sort of like the soul and and heaven and hell? When, you know, we were reading, just talking about this article in The Guardian earlier, but... In yeah. that they talk about the possibility of being able to download your consciousness or your yeah. soul, effectively, is what they're kind of saying. So, I mean, yeah. what's your kind of take on that, basically? Yeah, I think I think that that's just um, I think that's just a sort of philosophical category error. Um, <laughs> it's a it's a little bit like in in that film, um, The Prestige. I don't know if you've seen that that yeah. film where 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 Hugh Jackman at the end I think I'm right in saying that he can basically clone himself yeah. and this is this is presented as him him continuing him him having a continuing identity I mean it's a little bit different it's not exactly the same but it's the same kind of principle um the idea being that you are essentially I mean it's it's, it's I mean I, I may be misrepresenting it but but I think this is right so so your your memories are essentially what you are or or at least your what what would it be like your if you if you think about it like the human being is uh, on the analogy of a, of a computer with um with software and hardware i don't know something like that yeah. so you can you can take you can take the software and put it onto another computer and then that's you know that that's essentially what the what the computer is and that's that's the analogy i think that's that they're using there but if you think about it um as a, a human being well, I would want to say at least that you're you're far more than the information that's in your in your brain or in your memories or even your. I don't even know what it would mean to take your faculties and download them onto a computer. And what would that even mean? Would it would it mean your 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 intelligence, your IQ, your ability to what do do the word all? I don't know. You know what does it what did, what would it even mean? It's just it a would, simulation. Mm. Yeah, it wouldn't be you though, would it? No. There is there is something which is you, which is not reducible to the information in your brain. I mean, it's just it's just obvious. If somebody has a head injury, and they they lose their memory, or if somebody has Parkinson's disease or motor neurons disease or something like that, and they gradually fade away, you don't say, well, that person doesn't exist anymore. You say that that person's you know cognitive abilities are impaired or something like that. 
You want to say that's something that's actually you as a, as a human being. And of course, I would say it's your soul, you know, it's given to you by God. You know, it's, it's the, um, it's the, it's the combination of, of your soul and your body, which makes you who you are. You're not, and you're not reducible in that way. And it just seems to me that um, these, these ideas are um, sort of farcical, really. As a result, they're kind of silly. You, can't, you kind of think, well, can't you see that that's not a human being? <laughs> you know, you download, well, so what do you, you, you think you're going to be trapped, are you going to be like trapped in a computer? I don't, I don't, what is the idea? I don't even understand it. It's just incoherent to me. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, I mean... Good, I, good luck, I would say. Go yeah. knock yourself out, give it a go. I'm not signing up. I think, it, yeah, again, it. It, it's, it, um, it might link back to this kind of idea you mentioned before about consequences, you know. There's, then there is no consequences, or, the, you know, the ultimate consequence of going to hell or whatever, how you want to frame it. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, no longer sure. there, is it? Yeah. Um, well, it's, well, it's an eternity without... It's, a, it's an eternity without god isn't it so <laughs> this is this is like um this all of this stuff is is a parody of christianity it's a parody of mm. eternal life it's like we don't want the real heaven mm. but we'll create a heaven on a computer i mean who wants that i mean you know, part- I've, got, I've got more respect for, for atheists who just say well i believe that i'll just die and then and then that's it well a more respectable position reading that article in the guardian that was the impression that i take i took away is that this is the atheist <laughs> the atheist coping mechanism with dealing with their own mortality because they've rejected the possibility of a life after mm-hmm. the the life that we're in and that is cold and frightening mm-hmm. um you know people can drift towards nihilism and all these other awful things so this is a comfort blanket maybe this is why isn't this part of why why ray kurzweil went on this didn't he lose his father and he was he was trying to stop it happening again for for himself. I think that was part of his. Right. He's at Bilderberg, by the way. This uh, yeah. uh, right now, yeah, okay as well. I think he's there. Right. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I got a couple of quotes from the article. Um, I thought this was illuminating. This quote. Um, this is from the Friday's Guardian. If anyone wants to check it out, the link will be in the show notes. But anyway, it says um, transhumanism is a movement that aims to address or end what Bohan, the author of the book, calls the tragedies of reality, aging, sickness, and involuntary death. It is, she writes, a, a philosophy and a project that aims to make us more than human. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would aging, sickness. Th- this is suffering yep. mm-hmm. and we live we have our minds working in a kind of duality you know we can't understand make sense of pleasure without suffering mm-hmm. it's the it's it's what light and dark yin and yang good and bad we can't you know they they they, they want to put us into this world where of like eternal bliss it's like that red dwarf better than life simulation <laughs> yeah. you know and it becomes yeah. it becomes meaningless and valueless Mm. you can't judge the value of something being good without having the comparative of something bad Mm. and this is the road they're taking us down but yeah further down the down the article it said that i found this hilarious experiments are already underway in the realm of artificial wounds and bohan is sure when viable women will be clamoring to be freed from the shackles of pregnancy, childbirth, and breastfeeding. Yeah, yeah. Three of the most important, meaningful, special, you know, uh, Mm. things that a person can do, a female. You have to be a female, but, you know, these are the most important, uh, you know, these these things should be reverenced. You know, bringing a, ch- a a life into the world is the most special thing a person can do, but it's shackles. It's it's, yeah. it's related to shackles. It's I just found it gobsmacking. Mm. Well, well, it's it's because we have a perverse notion of freedom, um, whereby freedom is you know a sort of freedom from restraint, um, whereas in a in a sort of classical definition of freedom, freedom is the freedom to become what you are created to be. And um, that this is this is what this is what this is what it is to be truly free. It's the difference between a child um, getting up at a piano and just bashing the keys randomly, and 
uh, a musician who has cultivated through practice the ability to play Mozart or Chopin or whatever it is. That's what freedom is. And that's an analogy with, with humanity. And you see that with, with um, not, not that being a mother is, is the only thing that women can be or even that, that women must be mothers or even that they can, be, can all be mothers. But when you see women who, who are mothers, who are good mothers, you see a fulfillment of an aspect of a woman's humanity in that. And you're, you're quite right. I mean, I, I find all this, I mean, it's interesting to talk about it, don't get me wrong, but I find it so, I find it so distasteful listening to the crass, um, intellectually vapid and banal <laughs> thoughts of these idiots. I mean, which is, which is really what they are. They, they posture as, as intelligent people, but they are, they are not, they are not intelligent. They are not original thinkers I don't know how they. I don't know how they've got the platform. I don't know how Yuval Noah Harari's got the platform that he has, um, but he's not an intelligent person. He's not. You know, people will not be reading his books in a hundred years' time. I, I guarantee you, they will not because because these people don't have an original thought in their heads. Um, the the thing about um, you know wanting to defeat aging, sickness, blah blah blah. I mean, again, I mean, all I can say is that it is a parody of the Christian gospel. Mm. which is that Christ Christ defeats the twin enemies of sin and death those are the two those are the two major problems we have in the world sin and death our inability to be what we should be which is sin regarding god and other people and the fact that we're all going to die you know we we will age and we will die um and 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 that and that's the problem we have mm. it's a serious problem and what these people are suggesting is that we can we can eradicate these problems through technology and i'm sorry we can't it's just nonsense you should read read frankenstein for a start and you'll you know you'll get some ideas as to why it was written by a 17 year old by the way frankenstein you know mary shelley knew this when she was 17 and these these people have got these people have got absolutely no idea the modern prometheus yeah 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 um, exactly yeah yeah um yeah Jamie, we've done over an hour already. Yes. I don't think, guys, I've really enjoyed this. This has been great. Thanks for just letting me just... I don't, I've got no ideas listening to this, so, you know, um, I, I, I hope your audience have enjoyed it, but I, I, I felt very free to just let loose. It's, it's quite great. nice being on another podcast because I, uh, I just sort of feel like I can just, just say whatever I like and you guys have got to deal with the consequences. So thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry we didn't talk about your podcast at all. Oh, yeah. so that's okay. I mean, yeah. I, could, I could do a brief plug now. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so Irreverent Faith in Current Affairs, we've been um, described as like Top Gear with Bickers. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I hope we're slightly more highbrow uh, than that, maybe a little bit. Um, yeah, anyway, yeah, we started we start the podcast during the pandemic, or, you know, the, the ostensible pandemic. Um, I try not to call it pandemic because I don't really believe it was one. But, um, but anyway, we started the podcast then. And uh, it's me and, and two of my my bicker friends who they live in different places to me, so we do it on Zoom. Uh, Tom and Daniel, and uh, yeah, it's it's lots of fun. We we just talk about stuff from I guess our USP is that we're all Anglican vicars. We're vicars in the Church of England, but we're we're Orthodox. And we are we we obviously have a sort of conservative um, approach to things, um, and we and we give it we give it straight. So there's no there's no uh, there's no kind of church talk if you like we're just we're just straight about what we think and um, yeah it's it's on um, we're on Rumble on Odyssey so you can just you know just type us in the Reverend Faith and Current Affairs and um, we are on all all major major audio platforms we are one of the they're not supposed but we are one of the most listened to Christian podcasts in the UK now we're actually number one last week for a few days which was which was quite exciting uh, so we we found an audience and, and people enjoy listening um, and so yeah so if anyone wants to to look us up you know please do so I have I've subscribed and it comes highly recommended from yours truly if your podcast rotation is feeling a little stale mm -hmm. want to switch it up try something new I'd highly recommend it it's a great show um Right, let's sign off. Let's mm -hmm. sign off for for uh, and then have a short interval. Yeah. Jamie, just stay on the line for us for one minute while we uh, play ourselves out. And uh, thanks very much for coming. Links well, in the I show notes. Later. Yeah, check it out. Check it out. Right. Catch Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Catch you on the flip side. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>